To some, the civil rights era seems like ancient history, but to others, it's within living memory. Today's guest helps put the history of that era into a broader context about who we are as a people and what it means to be an American. She's Dr. Francoise Hamlin, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to a Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. And I'm G. Wayne Miller, also with Salve's Pell Center. And our guest this week is a scholar and author. Dr. Francoise N. Hamlin is the Royce Family Associate Professor in History and Africana Studies at Brown University. She joins us today from Providence. Francoise, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. You know, uh, you know, we, the, we're impressed by your scholarship. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, but, you know, I was recently having a conversation with a colleague about the contributions of the African American community to the history of the United States and the reminders of the greatest ideals that sort of made the United States a nation, whether we're talking about Frederick Douglass in the 19th century, Martin Luther King uh, Jr. in the last century. Uh, in the, when we think about the grand scope of American history, what are those contributions like uh, in, in, in from, from uh, black Americans? Um, I mean, you, you've, you've said it, right? The contributions are very great um, and they go beyond sort of the figurehead leaders that you have mentioned. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of people just in, in every community um, and in every society that um, has contributed, um, you know, arguably African Americans are central to the actual construction of this country, literally. Um, and so that is one of the reasons why, you know, this history is so important. It's, you know, I, I when I teach black history is American history, American history is black history. So I do oh, African American history. So I don't really separate the two. Um, in a way that I think is often separated too often. Well, you know, and you, you, in your in your scholarship in particular, you've also brought black women into into that mm -hmm. history. Uh, and can you can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I think you know, the, you know, the question is, black women or women have always been in history, right? I mean, they've always been, you know, they're they're actually the majority of the population, right? They're the backbone of societies. They're the backbone of communities and households. So the fact is, so why, why have they been excluded? It's because they've been excluded from the institutions that have given, um, you know, and the people who are in these institutions have given themselves the authority to write history. And so they exclude everyone else from that history. Um, and then what you see is as women have gained access into these institutions, say the academy, um, they've, um, and, and let's face it, a lot of it's because of the civil rights movement, right, sort of black, the black freedom movement and those laws that have, were created um, as a result of activism, that they these women had opportunities to change the narratives once they got into, into, into these institutions, um, which is, again, is another question of, and, and a reason why we need to keep these institutions representative of society to make sure that everyone's stories are out and none are uh, sort of, you know, raised up higher than that anyone else is. So your book, Crossroads at Clocksdale, looks at the struggle for freedom in the Mississippi Delta after the Second World War. And black troops had fought in World War I, a war to make the, a war to make the world safe for democracy, only to return home to this country to Jim Crow. What did civil rights gain, or why did civil rights gain more traction after the Second World War than the first? What changed? Um, I think, uh, you know, I like to call it the perfect storm after World War II that didn't, wasn't in sort of in place during World War I. Um, you have a greater number of African-American soldiers out in, in combat in World War II, in part because of, um, a lot of agitation and um, activism that had happened in the interwar years to include more folks in the in the um, military, right? Um, starting with A. Philip Randolph, well, not starting, but culminating in A. Philip Randolph in 1941, 
um, kind of pushing FDR to um, start opening up um, the army and the armed forces in ways that hadn't been done before. Um, and uh, the, the perfect storm also comes in with the GI Bill after the war, more people coming back, um, able to take a little bit of, of advantage, um, particularly educational advantage, and um, go to college and universities, um, come out with, with some skills beyond, you know, manual laborer, laboring, so that they could um, become more financially independent from the plantation system of, or whatever manufacturing system that had held them in, in sort of financial bondage for all of these years. Um, and we're also dealing with, at, at the Second World War, at the end of the Second World War, an increase in travel, an increase in knowledge, an increase in um, how information is received, um, which is different. I mean, we're talking about a 50 year, almost 50 year period, 40 year period, and technology has improved a lot. So the circulation of information and what have you is very important in movement making. So let's look at education today. There are some who will argue that American history is too divisive, that our children are too young to know what Ruby Bridges endured herself as a child, and also Emmett Till. What do you say to voices that are making that argument? Um, may I be blunt? I call them hypocrites. Um, I think these are the people who are making those suggestions are the people who are in line with those who caused the trauma to these children in the first place. Um, and yet they want to protect their own children from those crimes. So my question has always been, what was the protection for those children who were terrorized? And what whose innocence are we valuing when we make these arguments? Um, you know, what narrative do these folks want their children to know and to inherit and to perpetuate, right? Because this is really about control of knowledge. It's not about, protect. I don't think it's about protecting ch their children. I think it's more about making sure their own version of histories don't include them as the perpetrators. Um, you know, and, and so what's, what, I, what I find sort of um, important to add when I say this is that knowledge, you know, no learning about the past isn't about assigning guilt. It's about acknowledging the past, understanding it, and making decisions moving forward not to repeat it. So when you take away that ability to do that, then we are repeating the same crimes and the same um, sort of bad histories and using children as a, as a you know, sort of the, the innocence of, of certain children as a ploy to pull at heartstrings, um, which, but really and ultimately, we are not educating our children to be citizens of the world. Is is that a uniquely American phenomena? I, you, you know, I, I, you, if that's not an East Providence accent, right? <laughs> uh, uh, in, in your own experience uh, in the UK, was there a um, was are, are there elements of that history that are as contentious as the history of race relations in the United States? Yes, there are. Um, and I, you know, sort of our, our education systems are very different. Right. But um, I think I would like to think that our, I mean, again, and I, I've left the UK 24 years ago, I think, I think the society is moving a little closer to where, where America is now than it was when I was growing up. Um, and I think the history there was a was a lot more cohesive, a lot more inclusive. The media was a lot, you know, the BBC prides itself on actually doing what we, you know we actually had world history in oh. classes and it didn't center great britain um in the same way as i think american history even 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 teaching world history my son's doing it now it still centers america as the, as the center of the world and coming from a country that existed a long time before you know there are homes that people live in that are older than the, this nation itself um it's it's sort of I see sort of the, the disconnect there um, with learning the history. And then, and it became really clear to me, I was an exchange student in Mississippi in the 90s, um, coming from England um, where I finished high school. And I knew more American history than the people I was in class with who were Americans. Um, and that was really telling to me. It's like 
shouldn't it be the other way around? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, Francoise, in, in, in recent years, there has been a sort of moral panic uh, in some places and with some people about critical race theory. Can you break that down for us? What, what is the objection? Why would people care or, or object, not care? Why would they object? What, it's, what, the same, we... it's the same arguments clutching at straws that, um, that sort of creates the question before, like we shouldn't teach this history because of our children. Um, critical race theory isn't taught in schools. It's not even taught in most universities. It's a law, it's a law, lawyery term <laughs> um, created by lawyers. So it's taught in sort of professional schools. Um, and it's really sort of thinking about include it's using different tools and a different epistemology to understand the society around us. Um, and again, sort of again, this sort of fear mongering to say that this is harmful um, is to purposefully keep a population, the population undereducated, right? Um, so using smoke and mirrors to convince people that they're not the ones responsible for it, for whatever lack they perceive um, themselves as having, um, and that, you know, blaming other people for taking things away, right? So it's, again, this is blaming game, smoke and mirrors, um, but it's, it's a, it's a, you know, as we would say in England, a storm in a teacup, um, kind of playing this zero sum game in politics, um, to try and convince people that you don't have because of these people are taking it away from you, not you don't have it because we're taking it away from you from the top down, um, which encourages people to vote against their own interests. And we see this all the way since enslavement, right? The moment of enslavement. If you think about enslaved slavery, what happened? It took so many jobs out of the wage earning workforce. Um, so that's why you have a very, very, very impoverished white population who are literally on sort of living in the same dire poverty as or some of the enslaved are probably living a little better than them, some, depending on where they were. Yet, because of the system of racism and white supremacy and kind of feeding into and, and sort of teaching these folks that doesn't matter where you are, you're still better than them, even though really, you know, they're living in the same dire squalor as, as you know, folks who are enslaved. How do you how do you maintain that system? Because you're talking about a, t a tiny number of people who are sl owning slaves, right? Able to c maintain this institution through smoke and mirrors um, and this kind of system of white supremacy that's kind of baked into into the society. You know, I, I want to come back to the to your uh, uh, your high school exchange student experience, and uh, I, I, you know, one of the things that I think that you're right. So much of his, history education in the United States is focused on the U.S. experience, and the U.S. as that sort of indispensable nation, and, and the glorification in a lot of cases of American history. But if you really look at American history, we had 250 years of chattel slavery, 15 years or so of Reconstruction, and then what, another 70 years of uh, Jim Crow. And mm -hmm. America, the United States, does not become a liberal democracy until 1964. That's in the lifetime of, of a lot of people watching and listening to the show. Mm -hmm. The fact that we don't know that history well enough What's the societal cost? What does that do to us as a nation? It keeps us underinformed for sure, and it continues. It perpetuates the myth of um, uh, it, the myth that America is number one, um, and that and that it should be the moral leader of the world. When really, I would say that liberal democracy itself is a myth, and that we're still not there. I think it's a goal. It's always a goal, but not one that we, that the country has actually achieved. Um, 1964, the the date you cite is the Civil Rights Act, and the and then the Voting Rights Act happens in 1965. Right. Immediately, those 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 um, pieces of legislation were undermined, and now we can say that probably both of them hardly exist anymore. So, for me, it's always questions about progress and you know how are we defining success and progress when we keep on asking this you know returning back to the same questions and the same scenarios and again purposeful undereducation ensures that we don't move forward 
because we're always circling back to the same arguments. Um, maybe different, you know, definitely different circumstances. We're not in enslavement, but Jim Crow was a, a, maybe a touch ab above that. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and sort of where are we now? Um, so it's, 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 you know, as an, as an outsider, um, you know, there are so many things about the U S that don't live up to its own rhetoric. Um, and I saw that in Mississippi, you know, it was one of the reasons why, I decided to become an American historian because I needed to understand why was what I thought I understood about America built on what they were telling the world completely different from what I was experiencing wow. and what I saw. Um, and that for me has, you know, become something that I've, I've continued to work on and, and try to understand. That's fascinating. So here we are 60 years after 1964. How would you assess the State of the Union in 2024 in terms of race and more if you want to go even deeper? Um, that's a huge question. Um, I think <laughs> I think it's really important, you know, we've just had Martin Luther King Day and we're thinking about Black History Month. I think it's important to recognize that King was disliked by the majority of Americans at the time of his death. He was considered a race monger. He was considered a rebel, right? Um, all of these things that we now, you know, it's very interesting how now this myth of King his, is now this kind of, and, and um, you know, I have deep, deep respect for, for Martin Luther King and the work that he did, understanding the role that he played understanding that he would have he would die right i mean i think all of this is very very true um but in the same vein on on you know i think sort of this idea of um elevating this myth of him as this one person right standing on the the steps of the lincoln memorial and really only memorializing half of the speech and not the entire i have a dream speech right which is actually a lot more radical than than folks might want to admit um that that itself is is a sort of a miseducation, education for for folks because again it um, I think I've gone off on a little bit of a of a tangent, but I think um, it speaks to how we even if if we even if we do teach history of a black people it's of one person and it's a distorted history, and that is problematic, um, and it also. It also kind of um, excludes any possibility that um, movement making can happen again because we don't have another king, right? But in reality, you know, this is the sort of the research I do. Like you know, movements happen. It's not the civil rights movement. It's the mass. It's a massive movements that are happening in the individual spaces, and people are doing the work on the ground. King understood that, which is why he traveled everywhere to kind of because he knew the cameras were following him. So he understood his role as the figurehead, he understood it, he embraced it, but he also understood where the work was happening as well. You know, so- I I've gone real well off the, the subject. You no, it's, 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 it's a point well taken. You know, we're, we're, the United States now is a nation of what, I think 320 million people. Um, you know, we, we, we can't, we can, it's dangerous to speak in broad generalities. But if we look at America in 1963 versus America in 2024, has there been progress made? Are we better now than we were uh, before the Civil Rights Act, for example? Again, I would say, you know, what are the markers of success and progress? Um, have things improved? Of course, you know, people like me are in ed higher education institutions and teaching this history that this was not taught in the early, you know, earlier. Um, universities themselves have transformed to include women, people of color, different classes, right? All of that has has blossomed since the 60s. So that's, of course, is 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 um is improvement. But what are we seeing now? The attack on higher education. Yeah. Why? Because <laughs> that those, you know, those things can't exist. Those things can't, you know, prevail because it might actually change the status quo. It might actually break down systemic racism and that can't happen, right? So what do we go back to? They fall back on undereducating from the ch from childhood and trying to perpetuate these myths and fear mongering to create the, the scenario where 
folks will once again vote against their own interests um, because of lack of education or under education because they are getting educated, but just not necessarily in um, you know critical thinking and and what have you. So that's what I see. So again, with the ideas of success and progress, it's like two steps forward, one step back. Um, and some might say three steps back because, you know, 50 years later, we should be far ahead. So because technologically in so many other ways we are as a, as a race, as a human race, but this country um, sort of in terms of culture and society and morality, I don't think they have sort of the edge that they think they have. Uh, the kind, I say they, like I'm not here and I'm not part of it. Um, <laughs> but so, um, you know, and I think, and I think that's very worrying um, and that should be something that folks should be concerned about um, because we are living in a very global world, global world, a global society that um, where the, the attitudes and the opinions of the world actually do make a difference. So something else that is uh, really worrisome are some of the disparities between black people and white people, and those include health outcomes, education levels, family wealth, incarceration. The list is long, and we could do an entire show, three shows on that list. But in general, what do you make of that? Why and what might the solutions be? You're a historian, but I'm sure you have thoughts on, on where we as a nation might go. Um, you know, again, um, it goes back to, you know, you've listed all of these things after asking me how far have we come, right? So it's, 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 uh, it's that double-edged sword, right? So these, these, the same issues that we find uh, were an issue 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 100 years ago are still the same. Um, so I think that systemic racism hasn't gone away. It's trying to re it's reinforcing itself. Um, and until that is dismantled, things won't things won't change fundamentally. The system will always try and correct itself and 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 um, sustain itself. Um, and so education, how can how can we, you know, we have to fight this fight to undereducate the, the, our children. We have to fight for um, all history to be to be taught um, and to be taught sensitively and to be taught correctly. We have to then teach and reinforce, have civic lessons about the importance of voting. We do have to think about this idea of the electoral college because that is purely undemocratic, right from the, <laughs> right from the inception of the nation. Um, it's so that foundationally, this country was built on undemocratic systems and racism, right? And so understanding that um, and accepting that is the way forward to kind of thinking about solutions that might. Um, undermine and disrupt white supremacy but that's a huge that's a huge task yeah but i do think that's why education is always in the bullseye because it starts there it started there with Bo brown v board of education right this whole idea of keeping the races apart means that you can fear monger and you can teach a certain um rhetoric because you're keeping people separate and so their experiences match or, you know, they will never have other kinds of experiences. So the idea of children being together, children are innocent, they do play together, they do all of these things. You can't have that um, because then it starts being disrupted from a very, very young age. So that's why I believe um, most of the sort of the battlegrounds early on in the mass civil rights movement was around education. Yeah. Um, and, you know, before the war, it was with higher education, um, trying to desegregate law school, you know, things that had lower stakes in terms of numbers of people and adults. But then um, it, it, it sort of um, happened with Brown, Brown v. Board and sort of, you know, years of precedence in the Supreme Court. Um, so understanding, again, the role of the Supreme Courts and, you know, being on top of who's in the Supreme Court. Right. Um, and that all of these things do matter, if not for you but for future generations. So am I a little bit um, pessimistic? A little bit, 
because I do see this as systemic and I don't see the system. I see, I see that in the, you know, the civil rights movement um, and definitely Black Lives Matter now, the fact that we have another movement um, on the Black freedom struggle means that we didn't solve some of the, many of the problems that um, existed. In fact, we've circled back to them. But the goals of those um, and sort of thinking about sort of understanding systemic racism and understanding where power lies and how citizens can play a role um, with education and voting, um, again, is being undermined now blatantly. Francoise, uh, we've got literally 12 and a half seconds, but I saw that you have spoken about uh, Black History Month overseas at American embassies. What's it like speaking to international audiences about these issues? Literally 15 seconds. Um, and and it's, it's really interesting now because I'm a, I'm a Brit teaching American history, so I get a lot of, is it really that bad there? <laughs> You know, I mean, it's 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 quite um, terrifying. And I think, again, under education, people don't Americans don't travel very much uh, outside of their own bubble, um, or their own nation. And of course, it's a huge nation and many Americans don't even travel their nation. Um, so I always push my students to travel. But ba basically, I think, you know, again, the myth of America's myth of itself being uh, this great thing that every other country aspires to is not true. Um, so other people are like, What's it really like? Because it can't be this, you know. And I think because of social media, they're beginning to see it in other ways because the sort of the the TV programming and what have you is now supplemented by TikTok and what people are seeing on you know online. Uh, Francois Hamlin, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. That is all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about storing the public square, you can find us on social media or visit PellCenter.org where you can always catch up on previous episodes. He's Wayne, I'm Jim, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.